Hey there, interwebs. Mermay might be over, but try telling that to my production schedule. I've been chipping away at this video for what felt like an eternity, and now it's finally time for part 5 of my guide to monsters. Last time we took a look at scaly women within human tales, and now it's time to change things up by looking at scaly women within human tales. Huh. It's funny. It all started one night when I got curious about what exactly separated a sphinx, a manticore, and a chimera, besides spelling in a ninth level magic force field topped with razor wire. That was supposed to be a single video on its own, but it picked up a bunch of other monsters, and then jump started a whole video series for more of them. I'm now seven sentences into this video, and I have yet to actually say what it's about. That's because I'm procrastinating, because I don't really know which name to use, but I can't put it off forever. It's about mermaids. Mermen. And mer-women? Merweefs? Merfolk? Merlings? Mer beings Mersons? People of mer? Mer gender non-binary individuals? For the sake of argument, and my own sanity, I'm henceforth going to use the word mermaid like it's not gendered, and use the word ichthian as a blanket term for all human-fish hybrids including but not limited to mermaids. I feel like I shouldn't have to explain what a mermaid is to anybody, but I have to start somewhere. A mermaid is a creature with the top half of a human, often a woman, which transitions into the tail of an aquatic animal at the waist. If this definition is useful to you, welcome to Earth, check out the glaciers and rainforests while you still can, try our Hawaiian pizza, and remember where you parked. For everyone else, it's time to dive into the different subtypes of mermaid, and from there we can look at their relatives. There are two big ways that mermaids tend to vary in their depictions. The first is whether or not they're actually part fish. You'll often see them described as such in sporting scaly tales, but a variant which is gaining popularity is to specify that they're closer to aquatic mammals like dolphins and porpoises. I like the latter better because it makes more biological sense that they'd just be sort of weird cetaceans. After all, it's hypothesized that manatees and dugongs were mistaken for mermaids anyway. Additionally, mermaids have what appears to be hair, those breasts would indicate they lactate, and most importantly, their tails go up and down. You see, when sharks and other fish move, their tails make the swimmy motions back and forth, but dolphins, whales, and other cetaceans do the swimmy shimmy up and down. This is why dolphin tail flukes are horizontal and shark tail flukes are vertical. Making them mammals is also the first step towards solving the mermaid problem, and if you don't already know what that is, look it up on your own time because I'm not going to explain it here. The fish versions are usually able to breathe underwater, while the cetacean kind generally must hold their breath and surface for air, but that figures. The other way mermaids differ across works is if and how they can turn into humans, or rather humanoids with legs. They're still technically mermaids in that form, usually. If they can sprout legs and crawl onto land like some illustration from a textbook on the Markian evolution, it's most often by one of three methods. Method number one, voluntary willpower. These mermaids can go from fins to legs whenever they so desire, no strings attached. They should all be so lucky, but most aren't. That brings us to method number two, dry out. You can see this in Pirates of the Caribbean 4, but if you've actually seen that film, then you have my condolences. When the mermaid comes onto dry land, the tail magically becomes legs. Once she gets wet, though, it reverts back to aquatic form. This is generally handy, but inconvenient if a small amount of liquid should ever happen to fall on you. I suppose it could be worse, though. Method number three, magical deals. In this method, the mermaid drinks a magic potion, is put under a magic spell, or something similar which transforms her into a humanoid. In contrast to method one, there's usually some drawback or exchange beyond trading in the tail, which must be made. They also usually can't flip back and forth between the two forms. This is a potentially permanent transformation. Any of these methods also solves the mermaid problem, and if you haven't looked it up by now, I'm still not going to explain it because I'm trying to keep this PG. A fourth and final method, which was popular in ye olde folklore but is underutilized in current fiction, in my opinion, is a magical item. Murrows of traditional Irish folklore have special red caps that allow them to assume ichthian form, and Scottish selkies have a similar thing going on. They can switch from human to seal form by putting on a magical seal skin. If they ever lose this, they're stuck in humanoid form. Female mermaids are almost always beautiful, but it's common in classical folklore for mermen to be quite ugly. Male marrows have green hair and teeth, pig-like eyes, red noses, stubby fin-like arms, and tails between their scaly legs. This hideousness could be why female marrows so often take human lovers, but that raises the mermaid problem. I'm still not explaining it, but the resulting children were said to be marked by scaly skin and other ichthian features, and after some years, natural instincts irresistibly drove them to return to their ancestral home beneath the sea. Why does that sound so familiar? Mermaids are also hardly unique to the British Isles. There's the Niño from Japan and the Brazilian Iara, but the region which gives us a surprising number of sightings even in the modern day is southern Africa, with reports of Mondao hindering construction of a dam in Zimbabwe and the Cayman attacking fishermen in South Africa. The latter is said to have a fish tail in the top half of a woman with white skin, dark hair, and hypnotic red eyes, and their malevolent spirits who drown their unwitting victims. Come to think of it, why do mermaids have a thing for drowning people? To answer that question, we're going to have to look at some other creatures in the Ichthian family. 
I'd like you now to picture a siren. Got an image in your head? Good. If it looks like the women on screen, I've got some bad news for you, but if you're a regular to this channel, you probably already know what I'm gonna say next. This isn't a siren. This is a siren, at least as traditionally depicted. Early on, they were simply depicted as birds with women's heads, but this changed into women with the legs of birds and maybe wings as well. And according to the Byzantine Suda, they had the bodies of women, but were sparrows from the chest up. You used to see male sirens as well as female, but the men disappeared somewhere around the 5th century BC. If this is the first time you've ever heard of sirens, they come from Greco-Roman mythology and use their lovely singing voices to lure sailors to their deaths. This is usually due to crashing boats into rocks, but Dinon and Da Vinci both said that they put mariners to sleep with a lullaby before climbing aboard and murdering the crew. In many ways, they're similar to the harpy. So similar, in fact, that if you show the average person a siren, they'd probably think she was a harpy. Harpies also have the bodies of birds with the heads of women, though their attractiveness is far less concrete than the sirens. It varies about as much as Medusa's. According to some myths, they also live on an island, like the sirens, but they represent the wind's destructive forces and carry off evildoers. There were a lot of therianthropic women hanging out on islands in ancient Greece, apparently. This has led to a lot of confusion, and mermaids have picked up some traits from their island cistrons, such as their inclination for evil. What do I mean by that? If sirens murder sailors and look like mermaids, mermaids murder sailors, and therefore must be evil. There are other stories of mermaids doing wicked deeds that don't involve luring sailors to their deaths, so there has to be another explanation. Another possible source for their supposed wickedness is the notion that they're basically aquatic fae, complete with inscrutable morality. Mermaids from the Isle of Man are even known to reward humans for good deeds. One story tells of a mermaid who told a fisherman where to find a treasure after he carried her back to the sea when she was stranded on dry land. Another tells of a young mermaid who stole a girl's doll, but her mermom made her return it, along with a pearl necklace as atonement. Meros are generally affectionate, modest, and gentle, but mermaids from elsewhere in the British Isles and Slavic Rusalkas aren't nearly so benevolent, and in other folk tales their singing foretells disaster, but isn't necessarily the cause of it. These tales of maliciousness and ominous singing might be where the idea of them using the siren's song first found a foothold. Sometimes in Europe, dried skates were claimed to be mermaids, and other times called devilfish. These shouldn't be confused with devil rays or octopuses, for which devilfish is an archaic pseudonym. Interestingly, mermaids only earned the name devilfish when they were up to no good, and the tentacled variants are usually shown to be evil. Wonder why? Brief aside, these she-devil sea devils have no business being associated with mermaids and other ichthians in the first place. Cephalopods such as squids and octopuses are mollusks and more closely related to dragonflies than fish or cetaceans. Does the word vertebrate mean nothing to people? Biologically speaking, this is the best interpretation of mermaid anatomy I've ever seen. Look at those flippers. Homologous structures are good. And that's a sentence I don't get to say very often. On the other, um, fin, the dubious award for the worst mermaid anatomy I've ever seen might have to go to Melusina. Sometimes she had wings, either bird or bat, and sometimes she had a snake tail. Other times, she has a fish tail, or maybe two. You mightn't realize it, but I can virtually guarantee you've seen her before, probably on a coffee cup. That's right, she's the Starbucks mermaid, though she was originally a water spirit of a sacred spring. Now, who is this? If you said a merman, you would be technically correct, but I'm looking for more specifics. Here's a hint, he's a Greek god. You might see that trident and be tempted to say Poseidon, but it's only recently that people started depicting Poseidon as a merson. This is actually his son, Triton, the messenger of the seas, and although he carries a trident like his pops, his characteristic item is a conch shell which he blows to calm or rouse the waters. These days, a triton is often just another name for a merman. According to D&D, &D, merfolk are basically just mermaids, meros are monstrous abyssal merfolk, and tritons are just wet elves. You might be surprised to learn that Triton as a species isn't a new invention, though. Greek geographer Pausanias said Triton's children were the host of Tritons or Tritones, daemons of the sea. Triton wasn't the only child of Poseidon, because of the big three, Hades was the only one who didn't put it about as much as divinely possible, so the Earth Shaker also has a bunch of daughters called the Naiads. These are nymphs of springs, streams, and other bodies of fresh water, but they rarely if ever look like mermaids. Now that was Naiads, next is Nixies, Nex, and Nokken, who are water spirits of the Deutsch, the Dutch, the Danes, the Norwegians, the Estonians, the Swedes, and the Finns. They crop up all over Germanic folklore, but most especially in Scandinavian mythology, where they inhabit lakes and streams and lure people to drown in them by playing beautiful music on their violins. They're also adept shape-changers, and the two forms they most commonly assume are those of a human and a sort of water horse. The German Nixe is much closer in appearance to the classical mermaid we imagine, though the male Nix assumes many different forms, including human, fish, and snake, but presumably not all three at once. 
The most famous Nixa is probably Lorelei, who you may know used her lovely singing voice to lure sailors to their deaths. This, obviously, is a bit of a problem, but it's not the mermaid problem, I would hope. Very similar to Nex are Scottish Kelpies, not to be confused with Kelsey, Kelpius, or Kelp, and these are freshwater spirits who hang out in the lochs. They usually look like powerful and beautiful black horses, and an identifying characteristic is their hooves are on the wrong way around, a trait shared by Icelandic Nixies and D&D's Rakshasas. I also read somewhere that vampires of Eastern European or Slavic mythology also have transposed hands, but I can't find that source again for love nor money. If you've got a 20 on that chiral T, drop it in the comments because I'm supposed to be talking about mermaids right now. The Kelpie of the river Spey is white and lures people onto its back with its lovely singing voice. Kelpies also have the ability to assume humanoid form, though some accounts say they retain their hooves. Why does that all sound so familiar? They almost always turn into men, but most of the artwork shows them as nude, attractive young women. Wonder why. In one of these stories, a Kelpie turns into a handsome young man, but when his silver necklace is removed, he reverts back to his equine form. If a Kelpie is seen wearing tack, it can be exercised by removing the bridle, which can then be used to turn someone else into a horse. This strikes me as similar to a Selkie with her seal skin or a Murrow's red hat, but in the other direction. These aquatic horse-person combinations shouldn't be confused with ichthyocentaurs, which we covered before. In brief, they're kind of hippocamp centaurs, and it's not uncommon to see hippocamps with wings. Again, no idea why. Winged centaurs are pterocentaurs, but these are the only winged ichthyocentaurs I've ever seen, so I don't know if they should be called ichthyoterocentaurs, pteroichthyocentaurs, or something else entirely. You can also occasionally see unicorn or monoceros hippocamps, but are these unicorns crossed with fish, or just horses crossed with narwhals? It doesn't help that narwhal ivory was sold as alicorn throughout history. Speaking of alicorns, better known as characters, if you can have unicorn hippocamps and winged hippocamps, why not character hippocamps, ichthyocharapters, or whatever you want to call them? And you remember how there are sea lions and then there are sea lions? Same thing for sea urchins. Sea urchin, or urchion, was a Middle English word for a hedgehog, so sea urchins are like hippocamps or mermaids, but with urchins, i.e. hedgehogs. You can also now hopefully understand where this creature got its name. While we're on the subject of sea lions, confusion, characters, and cetaceans, I previously said that an alternate name for the sea lion was the morse. Morse is also an archaic word for walrus tusk ivory, the same way that alicorn can mean either a character or the horn of a unicorn. Furthermore, historic alicorns are usually just narwhal tusks, walruses are pinnipeds like sea lions, and all three are arctic aquatic mammals. Marvel at the interconnectedness of all things. The crazy nautical animal hybrids don't end there, either. In heraldry, you can slap a fishtail on almost any animal you like, and bam, you've got a sea griffin, or whatever. Lastly, say a hippocentaur banged a unicorn and had a child. Presumably, it would be a monocetocentaur. If you swapped a character for the unicorn, would you get a characterocentaur? And can you then make an ichthyocharapterocentaur? This is all getting a bit silly, so I made this handy chart to sort things out, and I should probably just wrap the video up here. As always, if you enjoyed it, like, comment, and share it. If you want more of my fantastic musings, follow me on Twitter, and if you want to monetarily support the shenanigans, pick up one of my ebooks from Amazon. In this case, I'd recommend A Flock of Wolves, in which fish people play a pivotal role. Artwork for this video was provided by Bunny, Emily Hopkins, Kelly, Rushu, Courtney Pearson, Brandy Anthony, Alyssa H., Anita Wolf, Sarah, Kay Gorman, Emma Lazauski, Samantha Scribbles, and Ludwig von Bacon, and all of the relevant links are in the description. Thanks for watching, and have a nice day. Now that was Nyads, next is Nixies, next is Nokken, who are water spirits for the Deutsch, the Dutch, the Danes, the Norwegians, the Estonians, the Swedes, and the Finns, and you don't want to know how many tries it took to get that line right. We can't just blame it on an invasion of the Sea Peoples every time. We're not Egyptologists. That was supposed to be a single video on its own, damn it. So the mermaid problem is how do you...